Hi and welcome to this on maths prediction of the Edexo Ohio Paper 1 2017. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Chris Gilpin and welcome to this predicted paper for the Edexcel new GCSE. Don't forget, if you are in year 12, year 13, you're, you're not in year 11, then you'll be doing the legacy paper. It's the last year of the legacy paper. So there are mostly these questions apply, but there are some questions in here that are not for you. However, if you are do if you are in year 11 or earlier and you're taking the new GCSE, that's the ones with the numbers rather than the letters, then this is a prediction of the paper. Now, first of all, talking about great boundaries, the great boundaries I've used, obviously no one knows what they're going to be because they're going to be predicted or they're going to be created from your exam results in uh, well in the process between June and August where they figure out where the great boundaries are going to be. However, they are approximations based on the criteria for each grade and also the actual Edexcel data from a mock um, exam that, well, that a lot of schools take uh, took. They are um, probably higher, a little bit higher than they might be on the actual um, GCSE, but again, I don't know how easy or how difficult the actual exam will be. So if it's a really tough exam, then they will be lower. Um, some people are predicting that a grade nine might be around 50%. I think that's unlikely. Uh, I think they'll make the exam accessible enough to be able to have a grade nine at a sensible number rather than 50% because it will squish all the other grades together and I know they don't want that. Now, of course, we'll not be happy with them if they do that. So, how do I predict the topics? Well, I base it on um, the specimen papers, the mock papers, the resources that are out there, the textbooks, revision guides, um, and mostly the syllabus. So, what are Edexcel saying to me that they want um, students to be able to do? I've also looked at the five strands, so that is number, algebra, geometry, data and probability, and the new one which is ratio and proportion, and this paper is balanced as it should be with those five strands. It's also balanced on difficulty. The AO1, AO2, AO3, if you know what those are, basically AO1 is a standard question, AO2 there's a written element um, of explanation, and AO3 is using stuff that you've learned into a, a different context. Um, AO3 is quite difficult for on maths or any site to replicate, so I've tried as much as possible, but there's probably slightly little AO3 than there will be on the paper, um, because basically you can't create unlimited questions with an AO3, you just get one question. Um, but there's probably, well, there is more AO3 and AO2 content in this paper than there was for the predictions last year and the year before that, because AO3 is such an important area. So, waffling aside, um, this paper is, um, uh, obviously I'm going to go through the paper on this video, however, if you go to onmaths.com, and there's probably a link appearing above me now, um, then you can do this paper online, it marks it yourself. If you sign up for free, then you can um, keep the scores and you can see your scores and blah blah blah. Um, there's loads of other stuff on this website, which are um, like topic busters, which go through each of the topics, all the different types of questions you might face. Probably by the time you watch this video, I'll have completed all the topic busters at the moment. Data and probability, there's only a few for that, so I need to continue my efforts um, with those ones. Um, there's also something called Minute Marks, which is a great resource. Uh, it comes up with a question, multiple choice, you pick one and then it, there's a video explanation straight away on the website that goes through how to do the question. So really great for last minute revision or revision during the holidays now. I hope you enjoy this video. If you do, please click like and please click subscribe. Enjoy. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So when you're sharing out money in a ratio, so you're given the total amount of money and the ratio you want to split it into, there are three steps. Step one is find out how many parts they're all together. So to do that, you just add the five and the four together. So you add the amount of parts in the ratio. So there are nine parts altogether. 
Step two is you find out how much one part is worth. So one part is worth. And to do that, get the amount in the question, which is 18. And divide that by the amount of parts we have, divided by 9, which is 2. So each part is worth £2. And then step 3 is find out how much each person gets. So James, he has five parts, each worth £2. So it's five times the two pounds equals ten pounds. Anna, she has only four parts. So four times the two pounds gives us eight pounds. So James has ten pounds and Anna has eight pounds. The last part is just to check your answer. Check that the ten and the two add up to the 18, which they do. Okay, if you want to have a go, pause now, otherwise let's get started. So, all you need to do is know the three rules or four rules of parallel lines. You need to know corresponding, alternate, interior or co-interior or allied or whatever you want to call them. And then normally you get vertically opposite angles within this topic as well. So which one is this? Well, what letter does it make? Well, it makes a Z, the armpits of the Z, and any angles, two angles on a parallel line that make the letter Z are called alternate angles. And alternate and corresponding are always equal. So question A is just 124, and the answer to question B is that they are alternate angles. Uh, if they were interior, which would be this one here, then they would add up to 180, so 124, and this blue angle here would add up to 180. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise, let's get started. So the first thing to do with these questions is make them top-heavy. The way we do that, is if you look at 4 and a third, we times the 4 by the bottom and add it to the top, so we're going to times 4 by 3 to get 12 and add it to the top. So that gives us 13. And the bottom stays the same over 3. And then we are times the 2 by the 4 and add it to the top. So 4 times 2 is going to be 8. Added to the top is going to be 9 over 4. Now what we're going to do is we're going to times both sides here by the bottom of the other fraction and we're going to times both sides here by the bottom of the other fraction. So 13 times 4, well I know 10 times 4 is 40, 3 times 4 is 12 so it's going to be 52 over and 3 times 4 is 12. Then I'm going to times 9 by 3 so that will be 27 and 3 times 4 which is 12 and then all you need to do is take away the tops so 52 take away 27 which is 25 and the bottom stays the same 12 the last thing we've got to do is work out how many 12s there are in 25 well I know 2 times 12 is 24 so that's going to be 2 whole ones and how many remainders? Well, if 2 times 12 is 24, that's going to be 1 remainder. So the answer is going to be 2 and 1 12. So we're going to do the same on the next one. So we're going to do the 4 times the 3, add to the top. 3 times the 4, add to the top. So that's going to be 13 over 3. And this next one's going to be 13 over 4. Now the rule with division is a same change flip. We keep the first fraction the same, we change the divide sign and we flip the second one. And some of the teachers call this KFC, keep, flip, change. So we're going to keep that or keep that 13 over 3 the same. We change that divide sign to a times 
and we're going to flip that second fraction. So 13 over 4 becomes 4 over 13. Then I times the tops. So 4 times 10 is 40. 3 times 4 is 12, so that's going to be 52. And times the bottoms. So that's going to be 39. So I've got to work out how many 39s go into 52. Well, I know 2 times 39 is going to be way more than 52. So it's going to be one whole one. And then I've got to work out what 52 take away 39 is going to be. And that's going to be 13 over 39. Now 13 over 39, if I divide top and bottom by 3, uh, sorry, by 13, I get 1 over 3. So that's 1 and a third. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. Now the main equation to realise for this is y equals m x plus c. Now m and c are both values you're trying to find out. m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept. So let's have a look at what c is first because it's normally the easiest. C is just the point that the line hits the y-axis. So C is just 5. To find M is a little bit harder. M is called the gradient, and it's how steep the line is. So if I pick where it hits the y-axis, although you can pick any point, and I go across from there, 1 square, and I go up, the gradient is for every 1 we go across, how far do we have to go up? 2. So the gradient is 2. So we've got y equals 2x plus 5. And that's our answer. Now if you've got a line going downwards, the gradient, which is this one here, will be a negative. And sometimes it goes up 1. So you might get y equals 1x. Well, you would write y equals x. If it goes down 1 for every 1 it goes across, then it will be minus x. OK, if you want to have a go, pause the video now. Otherwise, let's get started. Now, obviously I've got limitations here of not being able to, to use a compass, but I can show you what you should be doing. Put the compass point on where that red dot is and just draw an arc there. It should look something like that. Then put the compass point on where your arc and the, the line uh, BA cross or intersect and draw an arc across here and then do the same using the same width of compass on line BC and then all you have to do to get the marks is join B up with where those lines intersect. Don't rub any of that out, all of those arcs give you marks. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So question A asks us to work out Tamsin's speed as she was travelling to the shop. So the point at which she's at the shop is here. So the distance she's travelled is 30. So she's travelled 30 kilometres. And the time it's taken her is three quarters of an hour. And because it wants the unit in kilometres per hour, it's useful we do always do the time in hour in hours now the triangle for working this out is has speed and time at the bottom and distance at the top which means if we're looking for speed which is uh, this one here then we're doing distance divided by time so we're doing 30 divided by three quarters of an hour. Now with this, when we're dividing fractions, we do same change flip, so keep the 30 the same, times 4 over 3. 30 times 4 is 120, and 120 divided by 3 is 40. Now a different way you could have worked this out is just have a look, it's it's going up 10 for every 15 minutes. So if we had another quarter of an hour to make a full hour, 
then it would go up to 40, so it's 40 kilometers per hour. The next question asks us to work out how long Tamsin spent at the shop. So the shop bit is this next bit here. And if you have a look, it's going to be 15 minutes. So the answer to that is just going to be 15 minutes. Okay. So the next part of the question says, Tamsin travels home uh, from the shop at 60 kilometers per hour. Complete the travel graph. If you'd like to pause the video now and have a go. Otherwise, let's get started. So she's looking at doing it for, uh, she's traveling at 60 kilometers per hour. So she's currently 30 kilometers away. So if she's traveling at 60 kilometers per hour, then it means she'll get there in half an hour. So I'm going to start where she's currently at and she's going to get home within half an hour. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So we're going to do a factor tree. I'm going to start with 88. And I'm going to split it up into two numbers that times together to make 88. So I always pick 2 if it's an even number, and so half of 88 is 44, so 2 times 44 is 88. Now I always put a circle around any prime numbers because I can't split that up anymore without using 1. So 1 and 2, 1 and 2, you can go, go on forever. And I'm going to split this up. Again, it's even, so I can use 2. That's a prime number. 2 times 22. Split that up again. Uh, I can use 2 again. And 11 is also a prime number. So my answer would be 2 times 2 times 2 times 11. And I always put them in order of size. But 2 times 2 times 2 is 2 cubed times 11. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So we've got two bags here. We've got a bag one and we've got bag two. So bag two is over here and bag one is here. Now with tree diagrams, we always start here and we think, right, what's the probability that I'll go down the blue path? Well, there are three blue counters and there are eight altogether because there are three blues and five reds. What's the probability I go down the red path? Well, there's five red counters, and again, there's eight altogether. Now, imagine I go down the blue path. What's the chance of me going down the second blue path? Well, there's five blues in this second bag, and there's eight altogether. And there's chance of me going down the red path. Well, there's three reds and eight altogether. Now, imagine I go down the red path first of all with bag one. Well, there's a similar, well, the same probabilities. 5 over 8 for blue and 3 over 8 for red. And that's our probability complete, probability tree complete. Next question says, work out the probability that two counters picked are different colours. So we've got to think carefully here. What options are there that go um, to different colours? Well, let's follow the paths. So I go down the blue path and then the blue path. So I end up with a blue and a blue. Well, we don't want that. Those aren't different colours. So let's try again. Go down the blue path. This time I go down the red path. So it's blue and then red. Well, they're different colours, so that's good. We'll keep that. Next I go down the red path first of all, and then the blue path. So red then blue. Well, they're different colours, so we like that. And the last one, I go down the red path, and then the red path. Well, they're the same. We don't want those. So there's two outcomes that give us the two different colours which we're looking for. Next, I write down the probabilities that we pass to get to blue-red. Well, that's 3 over 8. And, which is a times in probability, 3 over 8. Times them together to get the total probability. So that's 9 over 64. And let's do the same with the red and blue. So that was 5 over 8, which is the red. And 5 over 8, which is the second blue. Times the tops, 25 over 64. 
So we're looking at this probability or this probability. And the word or in probability means add. So to finish this question off, you do 9 over 64 plus 25 over 64. So 25 plus 10 is 35, so that would be 34 over 64. And I can simplify that. So I can half tom bomb, half of 30 is 15, so that's going to be 17 over 32. And that's my answer. Okay, if you'd like to pause the video, otherwise let's get started. So we have a new planet that is that weight. And we've got the mass of the Earth. So we've got two masses. And we're asked how many times heavier is the new planet than Earth. So if the new planet was 10 and Earth was 2, then to work out how many more times heavier it is, we just divide it. It would be 5 times heavier. This time we don't have simple numbers. We've got standard form. So the new planet is this. And Earth is this. So we just divide them. Now the way of dividing these is we pair up the numbers together. And we pair up the, te the 10 to the powers together. Okay, so 3.02 divided by 6.04. Well, if you write that as a fraction, you'll see that the top number, the 3.02, is half as big as 6.04. So the answer to that is just 0 0.5. Then with powers, if you divide, you take them away. So 24 take away 21 is 3. Now the problem is this isn't standard form. If I write this out, so we'll do 0 0.5 and it's to the power of 3, so it will be 1, 2, 3. And let's fill those in with zeros. So that's equivalent to 500. And the decimal point's there, so when we move the decimal point back to make it into standard form, we jump once and twice. So it's 5 times 10 to the power of 2. 5 times 10 to the power of 2. Now the reason it wasn't standard form before was this number has to be between 1 and 10, not including 10. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So it says that we have Adrian, who has 8 parts. We have Ben, who has 5 parts. And we have Charlie, who has 10 parts. The only piece of information given to us is that Charlie gets 18 more sweets. So the first thing to do is work out how many more parts um, Charlie gets than Adrian. So Charlie gets 10 parts and Adrian gets 8. So that's 2 parts more. So um, Charlie gets 2 more parts than Adrian. So if he gets two more parts and that equates to 18 sweets, all I need to do is do 18 divided by 2 and find out how many sweets one part is worth. So one part's worth nine sweets. Okay, last thing I need to do is find the amount of parts. So amount of parts. Each one of them is worth 9. So I do the 8 plus the 5 plus the 10. 5 plus 10 is 15 plus 8 is 23. So there are 23 parts altogether. Now if each one of those parts is worth 9, I just need to do 23 times 9. So there's multiple ways you can do this. I'll do a little grid. So it's 23, so 23 times 9. 
Uh, 2 times 9 is going to be, well, 2 times 9 is 18, and then two, 9 times 20, the 0 on the end, 180. And 3 times 9 is 27. So 180 plus 27 is going to be 207. So there are 207 suites in total. Okay, pause the video now and have a go. Otherwise, let's get started. Now, there's a real key word in this question, and that word is estimate. Anytime you get the word estimate or estimation, you know you're not working out the exact answer. So the first thing I need to do is go through the values and and figure out a estimate for them. It's normally one significant figure. So first of all, I'm going to start with pi. Now, pi is the same as 3.14, blah, blah, blah. goes on forever. So I'm going to estimate that to be, say, 3. It's always one significant figure, and so 3 would be a good estimate. The radius, it says, is exactly 3.11. But I'm going to estimate that to be 3. Now, I could estimate 4 over 3 uh, to be roughly 1, and that would be absolutely fine. I'm not going to, though. Um, so, volume equals 4 over 3 times pi, which we're estimating to be 3, times r cubed, which I'm estimating to be 3 cubed. So, you can see straight away that I can just cancel the 3's there. Okay, And you could have worked this out by 3 times 3 cubed, and then divided by 3, but I might as well just cancel them now, times, and 3 cubed is 3 times 3, which is 9, times 3, which is 27. So when you times something by 4, you double it and then double it again, or I could just do a quick grid, or I can do a long multiplication, 4 times 7 is 28, 4 times 8, so it's 108. Now, you shouldn't really have to do this bit here when you're doing an estimation, but sometimes it's just to make sure you get the right answer. So I could have just doubled it and doubled it again, but I'm positive I've got the right answer now. Now, um, it's common uh, for um, an estimation question now to get a second part which gets you to describe your answer, whether it's an underestimate or an overestimate. Well, let's have a think about what we did with the values. We rounded pi up, or oh, down, I mean, because it was 3.14 and we rounded it to 3. We rounded r down, so therefore volume is an underestimate. So in your answer, just say, say whether you rounded the figures up or down. And be careful, because if they're at the bottom of a fraction, then it works the other way. So if you round them up, uh, sorry, if you round them down, it will become an overestimate. So just be a little bit careful with that. If you want to have a go at the question, pause the video now. Otherwise, let's get started. So this question seems like it's really easy. And if you've got the answer of 60%, then you're probably wondering why there are three marks. The reason there are three marks is because the answer is not 60%. Now, it's easier to think of this in terms of the multipliers. So how do multipliers work? Well, whenever you want to increase something by a percentage, you always start off with 100%. Then you add the percentage to it. Since both of these are going up in 30, we're adding 30. So that gives us 130%. But to calculate using that, we need it as a decimal. So I'm just going to divide that by 100, 1.3. So if I lay Billy, James, and Sam out, to get from Billy's amount of sand to James's, I times by 1.3. And to get from James's to Sam's, I times by 1.3. So therefore, to get from Billy straight to Sam, I'm timesing by 1.3 and then by 1.3 again. So to work out how to get from uh, Billy to Sam, I just need to times those multipliers together. So to do that, what I need to do is 
do 13 times 13 okay and to get to from 1.3 to 13 I'm timesing it by 10 so I've got to divide my answer by 10 and then another 10 when I'm done so that's 169 so 1.3 times 1.3 will be 1.69 so that means that um, Sam has 69% more than Billy Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. Okay, so we're asked to complete the cumulative frequency table first and then asked to draw a cumulative frequency graph. There are a few more questions down below, so if you want to pause the video now and have a go at those as well. Otherwise, let's get going. So, um, the way of doing cumulative frequency is just think of it as a running total. So you'll always start off with the first number, which is 8, and we get add 4 to that number. So 8 plus 4 is 12. Then we're going to add the 15, which is here, uh, to the 12. So that will make 27. Then we're going to add the 22. So 7 plus 2 is 9. 2 plus 2 is 4. So 49. And then we're going to add the 11. So that will be 60. Now sometimes, not always, but it will tell you how many people there are in the question, which it does here. So there says there's 60, and we should end with how many people there are. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is draw it. Now be really careful with this. Um, a lot of people are used to um, frequency polygons where they're, they're always drawn um, at the midpoints. Cumulative frequency diagrams are not drawn at the midpoints. You always start at zero here and then all of your values are plotted against the maximums in the group. So we're going to start off with 0, 0, which is plotted for us. Then we're going to plot 28, which is there. Uh, and then we've got 40, 12. So 12 will be there. Then we're going to plot 60, 27, which will be there and 80, 49, which is there, and uh, 160, which is there. And be careful because the last value is not always going to be the top of the cumulative frequency graph. Okay, so that's it plotted, but we haven't finished yet. Now, it's absolutely fine if you join these up uh, with a curve. However, I don't know of any exam that you lose marks by joining them up with straight lines. So that's what I'm going to do. Just make sure when you join them up, you don't leave any gaps. Now, a cumulative frequency graph should either be horizontal or going up. It should never be going down because you're constantly adding things to it. Okay, question C asks us to find the median. And to find the median, all we need to do is um, draw a line across from halfway. So if we have a look at where halfway is, well, our graph goes up to 60. And be careful, it's not necessarily the value at the top of the graph, it's where the value finishes. So it finishes here, it finishes at 60. So we're going to draw a line across from 30, and it hits it there, and we're going to draw a line down from there. And I'm going to use um, my black black ink, uh, let's change the colour of it, and I'm just going to draw it down there. So you're looking at the axis, um, the x-axis seems to be going up in uh, twos. So therefore the median, so question C, is going to be 62. Okay, question D says um, find the age at which 25% of people are more older than. So this is actually um, the upper quartile. Now to find the upper quartile, you need to um, draw a line across from three quarters um, of the way up. So if we have a think, we've moved across from 30 uh, for the median, and the lower quartile would be half of that, which would be 15, and then you add the point, the lower quartile line and the median line to find out that it's going to be 45, so it's going to be a line across from here. So I'm going to use my black ink here. I'm going to draw a line across there. And draw this on for the examiner. So this is this is counts as working out. So if that point there is 70 there, 
and it's 1, 2, 3 squares, D will be 76. Now, um, as I said before, a lot of people get confused with that question. If you think about it, that point there, there are, uh, this point here, there are 25% of people older than it. So there's 25% of people above that point. So if you think about 100%, we've gone down 25% from the total, okay? which is why it's this point here and not this point here. Okay, pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So with indices, any number at the bottom of a fraction is going to be a root. It could be a square root, cube root, or any root. If it's a 2, it will be a square root, 3 will be a cube root, and uh, 4 would be a uh, fourth power root. Any number at the top is just treated as a, just a normal power, so that's just going to be cubed. So I will do the square root first. So I'm going to do the square root of 4 first, and then I'm going to deal with that cubed. So the square root of 4 is 2, and then 2 cubed is 2 times 2, which is 4, times 2, which is 8. So the answer to that is just going to be 8. Now it's the same rules apply with this. So the bottom one's going to be a root, top one's just going to be a normal power. But there is a negative there as well. Now, negative just means the reciprocal. If it's just a number on its own, it's just 1 over the number. Okay, So I can deal with that negative first by just putting a 1 over the 27 to the power of 2 thirds. So it's 1 over the cube root of 27, and then I'm going to square that. So the cube root of 27, well I know 3 times 3 times 3 is 27, so that's going to be 3 squared. And so that's going to equal 1 over 9. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So to start off this question, I'm going to call x 0.46 recurring. Now you might notice that's different to the one in the question, because I know that I can get to that um, decimal by just dividing by 10, so I can just do that at the end. So to make that 4.6 pattern go before the uh, decimal point, I just do 100x equals 46.46 recurring. And if I take those away, I get 99x equals 46, because the uh, two recurring patterns just cancel each other out. So it's 46 take away 0, which is just 46. And then I can just divide both sides by 99. So x equals 46 over 99. Now I know that to get from uh, x, which is 0 0.46 recurring, to 0 0.046 recurring, I need to divide that by 10. So 0 0.046 equals 46 divided by uh, over 99 divided by 10. And you can use the same change flip thing. Or you just know that if you divide something by 10, you just times the denominator by 10. So that's 46 over 990. Now I also can simplify that. So if I halve the top, I get 23. And if I halve the bottom, I get 495. I don't believe there's uh, that 23 goes into 495. And I know that 23 is uh, a prime number. So I've got 23 over 495 as my answer. OK, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So this question is all about do you understand the difference between linear, area and volume scale factor? If the answer is no, then uh, you've probably got the answer of 80 for question 1. Um, however, let's try and work out how we actually work it out. So. We're going to have a little table here of A and B, and we're going to have the scale factors in the middle. And we're going to have the linear one. Now the linear scale factor is just what you're used to. 
So A is 18 and B is 9. So to get from 9 to 18, we do 18 divided by 9, which is going to be times 2. And I'm going from B to A. So I'll show that with the arrow. So a volume scale factor. Now it says that the volume of B is 40. Now, to get from B uh, to A, I need to times it by 2 per dimension. So I'm going to times it by 2 cubed. Now 2 cubed is 8, so all I need to do for that is 40 times 8. You're timesing by 2 for each dimension. Since volume's in 3 dimensions, it's times 2 times 2 times 2. 4 times 8 is 32. And so 40 times 8 is 320. OK, this time it gives us um, cuboid A has a total surface area of 560. So if I just fill in that, and let's work out the area. So area is 560. Now, there's two things you need to realize. First of all, this scale factor is going to be 2 squared because there's two dimensions. But we're also going the other way. Now when we go the other way, we're just dividing. It makes sense. If we times it, we'll get bigger. And that doesn't make sense because B is way smaller than A. So we're going to divide it by 4. So we're doing 560 divided by 4. Now when you divide something by 4, you can halve it and then halve it again. Or we could just do a simple bus stop method. So 560. 4s into 5 go once, carry 1. 4s into 16 go 4, 4s into 0 goes 0. So that's going to be 140. And so we write it in. Always check your answers to see whether they make sense. Does it make sense that B has a bigger surface area? Also, look out for the word similar. Similar means that you're going to be using scale factors in 99% of the three dimensional and two dimensional questions. So as soon as you see the word similar, try and find the scale factor, either the linear scale factor area or volume scale factor. Don't forget also, if you're given the volume scale factor and you're asked to do something on a linear um, question, so compare two lines or two lengths on it, then you've got to make sure you cube root it. And if you're given an area scale factor, you'll make sure you square root it. OK, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise, let's get started. So there are two rules when you're um, changing the subject of a formula or rearranging equations and that's get rid of any fractions and get rid of any brackets so expand the brackets um, we don't have any brackets here yet although I feel that they will come soon so I'm going to write out the question so this is 10 minus 3y and y minus 5 and I'm going to put the lines in so I can show my work now clearly okay so whenever you've got a denominator or numerator of a fraction, you can imagine them having brackets around it. So what I can do is I can times both sides by y minus 5 to get rid of that fraction. And that's going to be a really important first step. So we end up with x brackets y minus 5, or x times y minus 5. And then we're just left with a 10 minus 3y there. Now, looking at the second rule, get rid of the brackets. So I'm not actually going to do anything either side. I'm just going to break open the brackets. OK, now the important bit of this question is to make sure that we've got the y's together because we want to make y the subject. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you might think, well, hang on, how can we possibly make y the subject? There's two terms with y in it. Well, we'll come to that in a little bit. So we're going to add 5x both sides to get the x's on the right hand side. So that will leave xy equals 10 minus 3y plus 5x. And we're going to add to the 3y so we get the y's on the left hand side. So we end up with xy plus 3y equals 10 plus 5x. OK, now we factorise so that we just get 1y. OK, so I'm going to factorise the left-hand side and 
get our, what our divide y out. So we've got x plus 3 equals 10 plus 5x. And then I'm going to divide across the x plus 3. So I'm going to divide both sides by x plus 3. When I do that, I get y equals 10 plus 5x over x plus 3. And I don't need the brackets anymore. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So we're looking at a proof here. The word sum means add, and that's quite important to answer this question. The word consecutive means next to, and divisible by three means that it has a factor of three. Okay, so if I just think about three numbers, um, so three, four, and five, and it's saying they're going to be divisible by 3. So when I add them together, so uh, 4 plus 5 is 9, plus 3 is 12, and lo and behold, 12 is divisible by 3. However, that's not going to be proof. That's just an example of the fact that three numbers add up to 12. But it could be right the way down the line, uh, billion, billion plus, and 1, billion and 2, don't add up, uh, aren't divisible by three. They're not in the three times table. So the way of doing a proof is, unfortunately for some of you, using algebra. Now, have a think about, well, let's name this first one x. So I'm going to name that first number x. What's going to happen with the next number up? Well, it's always going to be one more. So it's going to be x plus one. And what's going to happen with the next one? Well, it's going to be x plus one. 2. That simple. Then what did I do to get the 12? Well I added them together. So I'm going to add these together. So x plus x plus x is 3x. 1 plus 2 is 3. Now I haven't quite proved that it's divisible by 3 yet. And the way of doing that is just to factorise it. See if it has a factor of 3. So if I put in some brackets I can divide out the 3 there, and it leaves x plus 1. This here is a proof because it shows that any value of x, um, the next 2 up from it, if they're added together, will always have a factor of 3. And the examiner is looking at this line here for clear understanding of that. And you might want to write a sentence saying that it shows that whatever's in the bracket is being times by 3 or multiplied by 3, therefore is uh, divisible by 3. OK, pause the video now and have a go. Otherwise, let's get started. So the first question says find a to b, so a to b in terms of a and b. OK, so I always treat vectors kind of like um, roads. So I start off at a. I can't go directly to b because I don't know the name of the roads, but I can go to c and then go to B. So the roads I'm going down, well I'm going backwards through A, so I'm going minus A and then I'm going through B. So it's minus A plus B, or you could write your answer as B minus A, but it's customary to do them in alphabetical order. Okay, F is at point AB such that AF, the ratio of AF to FB is 2 to 1. I always like to do little notches here to show what we're looking at. I put a notch there to show that there's two parts between A and F and one part between F and B. The fractions therefore become a lot easier in the next step. So what we asked to find, we're asked to find uh, C to F. So we could go one of two ways. I'm going to go down here and then up here. So I want to go all the way along A, that's a nice easy one, and then I want to go two thirds because we're looking at two of the gaps and there's one left, so there's three altogether. So I want to go two thirds of the lot of the way along AB. Now we've already worked out what the length AB is, or the vector AB is, which was minus A plus B. So to find uh, CF. 
we're going to do um, a plus two thirds of minus a plus b. Okay, so I'm going to expand that bracket first. So it's going to be a plus, or it should be minus, shouldn't it? Minus two thirds a plus two thirds b. I've just times everything in the bracket by that two thirds on the outside of it. So this a means one a. One a take away two thirds of a just leaves us with a third a. And then there's no b's that I need to collect together, so it's just two thirds b. And that's my answer. Okay, if you want to have a go, pause the video now, otherwise let's get started. Okay, so this is actually a lot more complicated than it first seems. We're asked to find the angle ODF, which is this angle here. Now, what you need to get used to in these questions is to show all of your working out and reasons. Now, I'm not going to write down the reasons, but I will read them out. So, this first one, the first place to start is this one here, Okay, but you could have started elsewhere. This one I know is going to be 90 take away 32 because I know that the angle between the radius and a tangent is 90 degrees. So when I work that out, that's 58. So I know that's 58 degrees. Okay, the next one I can work out is this little kite shape here, um, which has a 90 degree here and a 90 degree here. So I know that all quadratures add up to 360. So I know that 360 take away two lots of 90 is 180. So to work out this angle here, I just need to do 180 take away 22, which equals 158. So that is 158 degrees. And that's just angles in a quadrilateral and the angle between a tangent and a, a radius is 90 degrees. There are other ways you can work that out, but I'm not going to go into them. Okay, so if I know that this one's 158, I also know this one here, because the angle at the circumference is half the angle at the center. So I just need to do 158 divided by 2, which equals 79. And every time you do working out, you need to give reasons in brackets afterwards. Okay, I'm not going to write them down because it will take too long. So that's going to be 79 degrees. And remember, that one is angle at the circumference is half the angle at the center. Then this one here I can work out because it's angles uh, on a point. So it's 360 take away 158. So that's going to be 202 degrees. I just need to make sure I put degrees on these. Okay, then we've got an arrow shape here, which is a quadrilateral. So we need to add up uh, 202, 58, and 79, and take it away from 360. So I'm going to do 360, take away, and I'm just going to add up all of the lengths that we know. And then that equals 21 degrees, which is our answer. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. So, whenever you're just asked to simplify a fraction of its own with algebra in it, at this stage of the paper, it's probably going to require factorising. Now, you sometimes get a difference of two squares, um, so look out for that. Um, however, both of these are just standard, boring quadratics. <laughs> I say boring. Difference of two squares are interesting, so therefore these are less interesting. So we're going to have two sets of brackets at the top and bottom. It seems the coefficients of all of them are x. So I notice the um, we get a minus 20 at the top. Um, so two numbers are multiplied together to make minus 20. Well, um, they've got to have a difference of 1. So they've got to multiply together to make that and add together to make that. So they've got to add together to make 1. It's going to be plus 5 and minus 4. 5 times minus 4 is minus 20, so that works. And 5 take away 4 is 1, a positive 1, so that works. Now, I know for this question to work that one of the ones at the bottom has to be the same as the top. So that might give me a bit of a hint. So let's get started with the one at the bottom. So they're both plus, so 
both of these have to be plus. And they times together to make 35. Well, 4 doesn't go into 35, so it's probably going to be 5. Let's try it and see if it works. 5 times 7. Let's try that. Uh, 5 plus 7 is 12, so that works brilliantly. And then all you need to do is just cross off the x plus 5 from the top and bottom because we're dividing top and bottom of that fraction by x plus 5 so that just leaves us with x minus 4 at the top and x plus 7 at the bottom okay if you want to pause the video now and have a go otherwise let's get started now the question here doesn't say rationalize the denominator but as you can see it doesn't want there to be a square root at the bottom so effectively we're just rationalizing the denominator so we're going to start off with um, timesing top and bottom by something to get rid of that square root at the bottom. And the only way we can do that is if we times top and bottom by 7 minus root 2. And it's something you've just got to remember. So you're used to timesing top and bottom by the third at the bottom. But if there's two terms, the 7 and the root 2, then you times top and bottom by the exact same thing as that but with the opposite sign. What that does is it gets rid of um, the coefficient or it gets rid of the root twos because we only end up with the f of foil and the l of foil and the o and the i cancel each other out. Okay, And it's, it's the difference of two squares effectively. So to do the top we're doing 4 times 7 which is 28. Uh, we're doing, uh, let's do 7 times root 2, so that's going to be 7 root 2. Uh, 4 times minus root 2, so that's minus 4 root 2. And then uh, root 2 times negative root 2, so that's going to be minus, root 2 times root 2 is just 2. So that's the top done. And you'll see the, the what, why I've done this now. 7 times 7 is 49. Now we've got 7 root 2 take away 7 root 2 at this point so they cancel each other out so all we need to do is root 2 times negative root 2 which is minus 2 so let's simplify that 28 take away 2 is 26 7 root 2 take away 4 root 2 is positive 3 root 2 and at the bottom 49 take away 2 is 47 so a is 26 b is 3 and c is 47 Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. Okay, so this has asked us for the inverse function of x. Now the way of starting this question is just instead of fx, just replace it for a y. fx just means y anyway, it's sort of interchangeable. Um, so we've got y equals 4x minus 10 over 7. And the way of doing the inverse is just swap the x and the y around. So I'm going to write the exact same thing again. But instead of a y, I'm going to write an x. Instead of an x, I'm going to write a y. And then all you need to do then is just get it so that it's y equals. So I'm going to start by timesing 7 both sides. So I get 7x equals 4y minus 10. Then I'm going to add 10 both sides. So 7x plus 10 equals 4y then I'm going to divide by 4 both sides so it's 7x plus 10 over 4 equals y or y equals 7x plus 10 over 4 now we've got to then take out the y because we put that in and just replace it for the f to the power of minus 1x so it's going to be 7x plus 10 over 4. Okay, I hope you found that useful. Um, if you um, want to try that for yourself, please go to the onmaths.com site. We are going to be making predictions for the paper 2s and 3s, and then when we've seen the paper 1, the actual paper, then we'll look again at our paper 2 and 3 predictions and adjust those and take out the topics that have already come up and maybe put in some topics we thought would come up, 
but haven't yet and we might want to put them into paper two and three then when paper two comes out we'll do the same for paper three so the predictions get more and more accurate the more we go on um, please check out the website we're constantly adding more stuff to it um, the topic busters are almost complete um, so hopefully in the next few weeks they will be complete and you'll have all of the topics there ready to practice um, the topic busters on the site uh, sorry, the uh, minute marks on the site are really, really useful. Um, so we're constantly adding questions to that as well. They're a bit quicker and a bit snappier. Um, and it means you can get through an awful lot more topics really quickly and uh, see your progress as you do the revision. Um, if you've enjoyed this video, please click like. If you have really enjoyed it and you want to see more from On Maths, then please click subscribe, which are probably buttons around me somewhere. I'd imagine here and here if I do the editing correctly. <laughs> so I hope you've enjoyed this video um, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Thank you.